Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we're going to be reading, once again, from the Majima Nikaya, the Middle Length Discourses. Tonight, we're moving on to Sutta number four. I'm skipping Sutta number three. So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors for a while, you know that we moved on to studying the Majima Nikaya. And we read the, the first sutta, the second sutta, but I'm skipping the third. And I'll tell you why that is. I, I like it. It's it's a great sutta. It's just, I, I read through it a number of times and just felt that there really wasn't enough there for us to spend a whole evening on it. And I've been really enjoying reading the suttas for you kind of in their entirety. And when I read through that one, I wasn't, it didn't move me in that way. So I would encourage everybody to read it. It's called Heirs of the Dharma. And it has a really simple message, actually, that's really interesting. He basically, the Buddha says to the, to the followers, uh, bhikkhus, be my, be my heirs of the Dharma. Don't be heirs of material things. And what he's kind of referring to is when these great teachers pass away, there is often like an argument about who gets to keep their clothing, who gets to keep their begging bowl, who keeps, you know, their material possessions are then passed on to the next generation. And in that little sutta number three, the Buddha basically says, don't, don't get hung up on my material things. Care about my teachings and let that be the inheritance. And then it's a little sutta about being an inheritor or an heir of the Dharma, not of stuff. It's a great message, a great, you know, great sutta. But I'm going to move on tonight to sutta number four. So this one's called the Bahaya Bahirava Sutta, Fear and Dread. But I don't want anybody to worry. Of course, I don't want you to worry. But we're not actually going to be talking about what we are going to be talking a lot about fear and dread tonight. But I would just as soon call this sutta the, the sutta on fearlessness. Because that's really what it's about, is about overcoming fear and dread. So again, I don't want anybody to be, you know, think it's going to be a downer tonight. No, it's going to be uplifting, hopefully. Um, oh, just really quickly, if you happen to listen to my SoundCloud, my kind of podcast, it's not a podcast, but people call it that. Um, it's where I do recitations of suttas and sometimes post Dharma talks. I, I recited this sutta, sutta number four, I recited it years ago. I, I got really into this sutta a number of years ago, and I, I recited it for my podcast, but I've never taught a class on it. I've never taught it. I've never kind of been able to expound upon it. So uh, just letting you know that there's that kind of recorded recitation, although I do plan to read the whole thing for you in a few moments so that there will be that. But let me just tell you really quickly a few things about this sutta before I read it. So first of all, again, I, I like this sutta a lot because it's about fearlessness, a very, very important kind of quality within the world of Buddhism. But the connection, the kind of the samyukta or samyutta between last week and the week before, the connection is two. There's two connections. You may recall that last week when I read Sutta number two, all the taints, all the asava, right? In that, the Buddha talked about the seven factors of enlightenment. And the specific language that he use, uses regarding the seven factors of enlightenment is that these seven factors of enlightenment, like mindfulness, investigation of dharmas, effort, 
you know, the seven factors of enlightenment, it says that they are all supported by seclusion. Tonight's sutta is about seclusion. It's about going off alone and being isolated. And so that's one connection that I want to draw from last week to this week. But then we are also still talking about the taints or the outflows. So the other reason why I really, really like sutta number four, the fear and dread sutta, you might, you might not notice it. So I want to draw your attention to it because it's just one quick little line. But in this sutta, the, the Buddha basically start. it's, you know, it, it takes a moment to get going, but once he does, oh no, it's right in the beginning. This sutta is all the Buddha talking about when he was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva. And then it's actually basically a, a retelling of the enlightenment of the Buddha. It's, so it's one of those suttas that I really like because it's actually describing, it has the Buddha describing his process of awakening or enlightenment. And so we have this interesting line that all of this is taking place before he was even the Buddha, and it basically culminates. The sutta ends with his enlightenment. So it's a very interesting sutta for that, for that reason. And I'll have a lot to say about that after I do the reading. Uh, yeah, otherwise, um, yeah, I think every anything else can kind of wait until afterwards. Um, everybody kick back again. It'll be a few, you know, it might be a little while because it's, you know, it's four or five pages. By the way, I was going through it earlier. I'm not going to do all of the repetitions. I'm going to do some of the repetitions, but if I did all of the repetitions, then I think the, the reading would take up the whole night. So I am going to, you know, skip a few parts, but I'm not going to skip it as much as, as skipped in here. I am going to fill it in a little bit, but not, I'm not going to fill it in in its entirety. So, so and uh, known put in links for everybody. If you would like to go check this out online, if you don't have the wisdom publication edition. Otherwise, here we go with the Bahaya Bahirava Sutta, the teaching on fear and dread. Uh, this is Majima Nikaya, Sutta number four, page 102, if you have the wisdom publication. And thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetava, Jetavana Grove, Anatha Pindika's park. Then the Brahmin, uh, Janasoni, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said, Master Gotama, when clansmen have gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of a faith in Master Gotama, do they have Master Gotama for their leader, their helper, and as their guide? And do these people follow the example of Master Gotama? That is so, Brahman. That is so. When clansmen have gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of a faith in me, they have me for their leader, their helper, and their guide. And these people follow my example. But Master Gotama, remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice, and it's hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles must rob bhikkhus of their mind, if they have no concentration. That is so, Brahman. 
That is so. Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice, and it's hard to enjoy solitude. One would think that the jungles must rob bhikkhus of their mind if they have no concentration. Before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too thought this way. I too considered thus. Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice, and it's hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles must rob bhikkhus of their mind, if they have no concentration. And I considered thus. Whenever other recluses and Brahmins, unpurified in bodily conduct, when they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their unpurified bodily conduct, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest unpurified in bodily conduct. I am purified in bodily conduct. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the Aryas, one of the noble ones, with bodily conduct purified. Seeing in myself this purity of bodily conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins unpurified in verbal conduct resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their unpurified verbal conduct, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest unpurified in verbal conduct. I'm purified in verbal conduct. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with vocal conduct purified. Seeing in myself this purity of vocal conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins unpurified in mental conduct resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their unpurified mental conduct, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest unpurified in my mental conduct. I'm purified in my mental conduct. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as a noble one, with mental conduct purified. Seeing in myself this purity of mental conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins unpurified in their livelihood resorted to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I'm purified in livelihood. I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest unpurified in livelihood, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins who are covetous and full of lust, resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, full of covetousness and full of lust. I am uncovetous, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, Whenever recluses and Brahmins, who are with a mind of ill will 
and intentions of hate resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest full of ill will and intentions of hate. I have a mind of loving kindness, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus whenever recluses and Brahmins, who are overcome by sloth and torpor, when they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke fear and dread. But I am without sloth and torpor, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus whenever recluses and Brahmins who are overcome by restlessness and worry and an unpeaceful mind, when they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke fe unwholesome fear and dread. But I have a peaceful mind, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are uncertain and doubting resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I have gone beyond doubt, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are given to self-praise and the disparagement of others. When they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I am not given to self-praise and disparagement of others, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins, who are subject to alarm and terror, resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I am free from trepidation, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are desirous of gain, honor, and renown resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I have few wishes, and therefore I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are lazy and wanting in energy resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I am energetic and found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are unmindful and not fully aware, when they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I am established in mindfulness, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Whenever recluses and Brahmins who are unconcentrated with straying minds resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I am possessed of concentration, and I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins devoid of wisdom, drivelers, when they resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their being devoid of wisdom and drivelers, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest devoid of wisdom, a driveler. I am possessed of wisdom. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones possessed of wisdom. Seeing in myself this possession of wisdom, I found great solace dwelling in the forest. I considered thus. There are especially auspicious nights of the 14th the 15th, and the 8th of the fortnight. Now, what if on such nights as these, I were to dwell in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as orchard shrines, woodland shrines, or tree shrines? Perhaps I might encounter that fear and dread. And later, 
On such special auspicious nights as the 14th, the 15th, and the 8th of the fortnight, I dwelt in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as orchard shrines, woodland shrines, and tree shrines. And while I dwelt there, a wild animal would come up to me, or a peacock would knock off a branch, or the wind would rustle the leaves. And I thought, what now? If this is the fear and dread coming, I thought, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? What if I subdued that fear and dread while keeping the same posture that I am in when it comes upon me? And so, while I walked, the fear and dread came upon me. And I neither stood still, nor sat down, nor laid down, till I had subdued that fear and dread. Then, while I stood, the fear and dread came upon me, but I neither walked away, nor sat down, nor laid down, till I subdued that fear and dread. Then I sat, and the fear and dread came upon me. And I neither, neither walked away, nor stood up, nor laid down, till I had subdued that fear and dread. Then I laid down, and the fear and dread came upon me. But I neither walked away, nor stood up, nor sat down, till, that, till, till I had subdued that fear and dread. Now there are Brahmin, some recluses and Brahmins, who perceive day when it is night, and night when it is day. I say that on their part, this is abiding in delusion. But I perceive night when it is in fact night, and day when it is day. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anybody, a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many, out of a compassion for the world, for the good, welfare, and happiness of gods and humans. It is of me, indeed, that they, rightly speaking, should say that. Then tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and undefiled, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapturous bliss and pleasure born of seclusion with the stilling of applied and sustained thought i entered upon and abided in the second jhana which has self-confidence and single-pointedness of mind without applied and sustained thought with rapturous bliss and pleasure born of concentration with the fading away as well of the rapturous bliss i abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware still feeling pleasure with the body i entered upon and abided in the third jhana on a, that state on account of which the noble ones announce one has a pleasant abiding, the one who has equanimity and peacefulness of mind. Then with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright 
unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. I directed it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. I recollected many past lives. One birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30, 40 births, 50 births, 100 births, 1,000 births, 100,000 births, many culpas of world contraction, many culpas of world expansion, many culpas of world contraction and expansion. There I was named such and such, of such and such a clan, with such and such an appearance. Such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term. And then passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too, I was named such and such, of such and such a clan, with such and such an appearance, and such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my term of life. And passing away from that place, I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me during the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished, and light arose, arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. When my, my, when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I then directed it to knowledge of the passing and away of an appearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human eyes, I saw beings passing away and reappearing inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass on according to their karmic actions thus. These worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, upon the dissolution of the body after death, they have reappeared in a state of deprivation in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings, who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of the noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of their bodies after death, they've reappeared in a good destination, even in a heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human eyes, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior, superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understood how beings pass on according to their karmic actions. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the second middle watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Dark was, darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. Then, when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. I directly knew it as it actually is. This is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. 
This is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the cessation of suffering. And I directly knew as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. These are the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the origin of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the cessation of the taints. And I directly knew as it actually is. This is the way that leads to the cessation of the taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge. It's liberated. I directly knew. Birth has been destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more clinging to any state of being. This was the third true knowledge attained by me during the last third watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. Now, Brahman, it might be that you think, perhaps the recluse Gotama is not free from lust, hatred, and delusion, even still today, which is why he still resorts to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. But you should not think thus, Brahman. It is because I see two benefits that I still resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. I see a pleasant abiding for myself here and now, and I have compassion for future generations. Indeed, it is because Master Gotama is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one, that he has compassion for future generations. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were putting upright what had been turned over, revealing what had been hidden, showing the way to one who had been lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dharma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. All right. So that's the Fear and Dread Sutta. So. Anything on anybody's mind to start? Anything pop out as either question worthy or interesting, delightful? Yeah, Tanya. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Okay. Hmm? Um, yeah, I was kind of interesting in the beginning when he was saying that he wouldn't go out into the woods until he had purified and done all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that. Because I would think maybe you would you would go to the woods because it would be easier to do those things. So it was kind of, um, but I can also see how going to the woods might cause fear and dread. But, mm -hmm. but also you know like kind of keep you know taking yourself away from all the things that, in a, like if you were in a city that might cause you to um, uh, cause it to be difficult to stay on the path. Mm -hmm. Um, excellent question, Tanya. It's exactly where I wanted to start. It's exactly where the sutta starts. So what I was going, and I, this is, again, where I wanted to start anyway. So again, thank you. What I wanted to draw everybody's attention to was, so, you know, well, first of all, and I don't want to actually, I don't want to spend any time on this, but I do need to kind of mention, so this jana. Uh, Janasoni is a Brahmin 
right? So this is a uh, a priest, but you know, a Brahmin is a religious person, and a big part of the of Brahmanism would be to go off alone into the forest to perform austerities and basically um i'm i'm abbreviating this but you would go off to into the woods perform austerities build up a lot of good punya a lot of good merit and then you could take that back to perform rituals or trans do all kinds of things with your merit my point is is that brahmins were doing this kind of Aranya practice, and I wanted to mention to everybody, Aranya is a forest. And so they talk about Aranyacharya, forest practice. This sutta is about Aranyacharya, forest practice. And the Buddhists are not the only ones that were doing forest practice. But from this and from other suttas and other information, one of the things that we can deduce is that part of the austerity of a Brahmin going off into the woods, part of what made it austere is that it was scary. And so you kind of like, you got merit, you got brownie points for enduring fear in that sense. So that's where the Brahmin's coming up to the Buddha and saying, hey, Buddha, don't you encourage your students to go off into the woods to practice? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, but isn't it scary? And the line is, yeah, I used to think that way too. I forget exactly, I'm trying to find it, but he says basically like, yeah, I used to think that way too. And then we get to the bulk of that first part of the sutta, which is what Tanya is asking about which is this idea of like, the Buddha says that, yeah, the Brahmins are going off into the woods or the forest, but they don't have their bodily, verbal and mental conduct pure. So what we're talking about, um, you know, impure bodily conduct, who knows, maybe they're stealing stuff, fornicating, you know, for a Brahmin getting ready to go off into the woods, they should be basically celibate, but they might not be, they might, you know, all kinds of things. So the Buddha is saying that the reason why you're getting scared out there is because of the impurity of your bodily uh, karma or your verbal karma or your mental karma or your livelihood, or you suffer from the five hindrances right? This kind of desirousness, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and doubt. Or you suffer from conceit, arrogance, or you're easily startled. And then there was, you know, being lazy, being unmindful, being unconcentrated and having no wisdom. So the Buddha is saying that because I've already dealt with my morality, meaning my bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, livelihood. I've already dealt with all of that. And then I go into the woods. And so Tanya, the answer to your question is, is that this is a really good kind of, it's a really good representation of the path of Buddhism, which says you have to get your morality right in order to meditate right. If you're all your your bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, if all those things are off, all your meditation is going to do is sort of level you out. But it's not going to get you further in terms of like liberation. And so, yeah, the first part of it, what the Buddha is saying is, is that I dealt with my morality first, then I went into the woods. And that's what sort of allowed me to overcome the fear and dread. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Noe and Gnome had questions too. Yeah, Noe? Yes, thank you, Michael. What a what a wonderful read. And thank you for the point. The, yes. 
it really is pointing to uh, a, a, a way of being in the world. This, this, this last part, you know, when he pulls it all together with the four noble truths, it's like, but where is that? It's here. Where's my fear? It's here. It's here. Oh, where's my morality? Right here. Oh, so I don't have, you know, I'm, don't get me wrong. It's a state, uh, it's a state that, that, that if, if when I sit in meditation and I grab onto the the balloon, <laughs> the topics that are going on in my mind, and I chase after them or I hang on to them, it, 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 it's difficult. But when I let go of them and just watch them go by, it's like, well, you know, there's, there, there is suffering. There is the origin of suffering. There is the release of suffering. There is this way to move through the world here. So I appreciate this. Oh, I'm going to read this over and over. Thank you so much for reading it. Oh, my great pleasure. Um, one kind of comment to what Noe just said, and I sort of meant to say this at the beginning, but I did want to stress that that like all suttas, like all sutras, I feel like you can read this one at different in different ways or in like different levels. And what I mean by that is, sure, we can read this as it, you know, as basically like, if you were going to, you know, hike the Pacific Crest Trail all by yourself as a meditation retreat, so you were going to go do some forest dwelling all by yourself, secluded in the forest thickets for a while, this might be a great sutta to read before you go do that. So on one level, this is literally about enduring the scary forests and being alone in scary forests and doing this Aranya practice. But like all Buddhist sutras, I think that you can also read it at a more, that this is about seclusion and fear. And you don't need to go to the woods to be secluded, but there is a way in which maybe you fear being alone or being isolated. And this is a sutta to help with that fear of being isolated or alone, or it's just a sutta to help with overcoming fear and dread in general. And I particularly on that note, because I might forget to mention it otherwise, when I was preparing for tonight's class, I was really struck by when the Buddha, so he goes off into the woods on basically on the, on the night of a new moon, not a full moon, a new moon. That's the fifth, the 14th and the 15th are the new moon. In the Buddhist calendar, you need to know that the full moon is the first of the month. They start on the full moon and then go to the new moon and then go to full moon again. So right in the middle of the month is the darkest period when there's no moon in the sky. That's the 14th or the, yeah, the 14th and the 15th, when he says he goes off into the woods. But then, you know, he's walking and he's hearing things. And then he says this thing. Why do I always dwell expecting fear and dread? That, when I, I've read this sutta, you know, so many times, and I've recited it a million times. But that line, for some reason, really hit me. And maybe it's because maybe I have, like, fear and dread on my mind lately. And I'm, and it hit me of like, yeah, why am I always, you know, you could call it pessimism, but it's like, why is the anticipation always the worst possible thing is about to happen? <laughs> what is that noise? Must be the worst possible thing ever. <laughs> Who's at the door? Must be the worst possible person ever. Like, why is that the go-to place? Reading the sutra, reading the Buddha, say that line struck me of like, yeah, why is that my go-to place? So then I read the entire rest of the sutta in that mind state of like, okay, well, and it was, you know, it's a powerful sutta for that reason. So, all right, no. And then back to Tanya. Um, 
Well, first, I just want to say that I recently listened to you reciting this on SoundCloud. Okay. Um, so today I was just like, I was having like a, almost like a deja vu. Because when you first, when I first saw that we were doing it, I didn't remember. I didn't remember it by its name. But then when you started reciting it, I was like, wait, I just heard this. Where did I hear this? And I <laughs> Um, but, um, I, uh, I was thinking about why the, the first part of the sutra makes perfect sense to me. The second part I'm really confused about, and I'd love you to explain it, but the yeah. part about the going, you know, if you're going into the forest, when you haven't yet cleaned up your act, then you're afraid that I can see that really clearly in in a few, I mean, we've talked here about like, if you are not always truthful, then you're afraid you'll be found out, you know, or if you, so there's, it's not exactly fear of darkness in the forest, but it's that idea that when you live more aligned with, you know, how you should, then you're not afraid kind of of what the consequences might be. So I was noticing that, but I, I don't get, where the jhanas fit in in the sutra. So that's the part I'd love to be explained. Mm -hmm. Why the first four and just how yep. that yep. did not happen at all. Thank you. <laughs> that's my plan for the rest of the evening is definitely to kind of explain how the whole rest of the sutra uh, relates to the beginning. So we're going to get there totally. Tanya, though, something on your mind? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was very struck by that same line also. Why do I oh, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? What if I subdue the fear and dread while keeping the same posture? And then he goes through the postures. Mm -hmm. So there's the postures and then there's the the jhanas. So are you going to kind of flip that back to how it answers that? Why do I oh, always dwell expecting fear and dread? Um, No, but I will say more about that now to segue into the postures and then the jhanas and then the what are called the three wisdoms the trividya that that get announced so let's kind of back up to that great line so why do i always do it why, why do i do always expecting fear and dread what if i subdued that fear and dread while keeping the same posture that i am in uh, when it comes upon me so this is a great example of and uh, th this is a great example of what early Buddhism refers to as the arising and passing away of a dharma or the arising and passing away of a phenomena. So the point is, is that he says, so the way that I read this is he's saying, so I walked into the forest and I got scared, like the fear and dread came upon me, but I I wouldn't sit down, I or I wouldn't stop, I wouldn't sit down, I wouldn't lay down until I had subdued that fear and dread. So by subdue, you could read that as until I observed it's passing away. Like that would be the like technical fancy way to say it. So the point being that he walked into the forest and observed the arising of fear and dread. And said, all right, well, I'm not going to stop, meaning stand, or sit down or lay down until I observe the passing away of this fear and dread, to which we are just understood he observed the passing away of the fear and dread. So then he stands still. And you can kind of imagine, like, if you were nervous in the woods, you'd keep moving. <laughs> you would keep it moving and you would be a little afraid to just stop and stand still. But once overcoming the fear and dread, we're to understand now the Buddha can stop and stand and the fear and dread arises. And he says, yep, well, I'm not going to like move away, I'm not going to walk away, but I'm also not going to sit down or, or rest, lay down until I observe the passing away of the fear and dread. It does. And that's what allows him then to sit in the forest, observing the fear and dread arising. He observes it's passing away. And then we understand he basically is sleeping now comfortably in the forest. And I want you to think about that idea of like just cuddling up in 
a dark, scary forest on a new moon night and just going to sleep. That is probably very scary, but we're noticing how the Buddha got there in these stages. And so for me, I understand or I read this sutta as like, so you've heard, and you you might have even heard me tell it, but I hope you've heard the kind of the classic story of Siddhartha, the classic story of Gautama, where he goes off into the woods, and then Mara, the evil one, comes to try to get him out of his meditation. And so he throws a bunch of arrows at the Buddha to try to scare him, but the Buddha just turns them into flowers. By the way, he does that with the Abhaya, the fearlessness mudra. And this is the Bahaya Sutta in that way, the fear sutta. But what I'm getting at is, is that we've heard the enlightenment story of the Buddha told in a kind of mythological way using Mara and arrows turning to flowers and like, you know, kind of miraculous storytelling. I like this sutta because I feel like it's the the unmythologized version of the enlightenment story of the Buddha, where he's not defeating Mara, he's defeating his own fear of being alone and secluded in the woods. And once he has defeated the fear, he can now practice, meaning he can now kind of properly do the jhana meditations. So that's how we get to kind of the next part. So everybody okay with that? Okay. So, and, and again, this is sort of not, I, I find this sutta interesting because this is not um, uh, bhikkhus. You should go into the woods on the fifth, 14th and 15th of the night or the month. No, the Buddha saying, I went into the woods on the 14th and 15th of the month. I did all of these things. And this is what happened. So it's kind of a different sutta that way, where it's not um, it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive, which is interesting. Okay, so having conquered this fear, tireless energy arises in the Buddha, unremitting mindfulness is established, bodies tranquil, untroubled, mind concentrated and undefiled. Or, or sorry, unified. And then we get the kind of classic description of the first jhana. So quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with uh, pretty with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. So that's the first jhana. And so we're all, we're okay with sort of the sequence of events getting into the first jhana. So once again, I would want to kind of remind you what I was saying with, sure, you can read this as actually going into the forest or you can read it as, you know, what does it mean to be secluded from sensual pleasures? Well, yes, you could you could read that kind of literally in terms of having um, sequestered yourself away from what might be presumed to be sensually desirous in that way. Or to seclude oneself from sensual pleasures could be, again, just to sort of close your eyes, close your ears, and sort of meditate, go inward in that way. So we can kind of read this a few different ways, but we are not, like I would say, and I know this makes me a certain kind of Dharma teacher, but, you know, I would suggest, I would say that you could probably never get into a jhana watching television. Meaning that 
to, you know, watching things is part of a sensual, you know, it's, it's entertainment and it's fun. I enjoy it. But the point is, is that when the senses are being engaged like that, the senses are being engaged like that. So we're not going to really be able to get into a jhana that way. We need to seclude ourselves from such things like sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. So that's what the Buddha did in the forest. But again, I'm suggesting you don't need to go to a forest. And so he says that he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought. In other translations of the formula of this, um, of this type of, of sutta, in other ones, it'll say, um, with discursive thought. Here, they're, they're translating it as with applied and sustained thought. But I think the really important thing to know as we move through these jhanas, it's really kind of important to recognize that the first jhana, there is still an internal dialogue. There is still a, a discursive thinking voice that is, is basically the voice that's like, this is nice, <laughs> meaning is like reflecting upon the fact that they are in a jhana and that it is pleasant, rapturously blissful. This is not like my normal day-to-day -day functioning. So there's a, an awareness Again, discursive thinking or applied and sustained thinking in the first jhana. But of course, what makes the first jhana the first jhana is it's so rapturously blissful. That's one of the characteristics or qualities of the first jhana. Very pleasant. And one is aware of how pleasant it is in that sense. But with the stilling of discursive thought or with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, the Buddha says he entered upon and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, but with rapture and pleasure, but this rapture and pleasure is not born of seclusion like the first jhana. This rapture and bliss comes from how concentrated we are. And that's an important difference to note between the first and second jhana as well. The first jhana, we're, we're kind of super stoked. <laughs> like we're really, it's like, it's cool, but that coolness is coming from, I guess you could call it like transcendence. And what I mean by that is it's like this idea of a rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. You know, you can imagine, you know, imagine, you could, you could probably imagine this. Imagine being socially drained. Right. Imagine having been at like, you know, uh, whatever, a conference or a party, whatever it is. And you're just it's like been social, being socially on for hours and hours and hours talking, talking about yourself and all of that. And then think about going into seclusion after that and like not having to talk to anybody for a while and being able to kind of be in like just solitude. There might be a great pleasure that comes from that, from that seclusion in that way, because you're kind of been exhausted or drained. So that's, I'm not saying that that's the same as this, but I'm suggesting that the way that you could get pleasure from being secluded and alone, the first jhana comes from not just, um, not just leaving the party, it comes from leaving the world. So we're talking about all your financial problems have been put down for a moment. We're talking about all your health problems have been put down for a moment. All the things of the world 
have been put down for a moment and you've gotten into this mental state of mind they call the first jhana. And so the joy and the rapture is coming from being free of the world, from this seclusion. But then in the second jhana, the chatter, the discursive mind quiets down. And that's where the Buddha says in the second jhana, there's a stilling of that discursive mind. And there's just the rapture and the bliss. But this rapture and bliss comes from being so concentrated. So it's not relative in terms of like, oh, this liberated state of the first jhana is so much better than being trapped in samsara. The second jhana is like not relative because it's uh, out of the concentration in that way. So I think that's kind of important to notice the difference between the rapture and pleasure being born from seclusion versus being born from concentration and noticing that in the first jhana, there's discursive thought, but in the second jhana, there's no discursive thought. All right, questions about the first two jhanas? Cool. But then with the fading away of the rapture too. He says, I abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana. And this is what they always say. This is like part of the formula or part of the language. The third jhana, it's always, the third jhana is the state where all the noble ones, meaning, you know, all the wise people ever have said this line, pleasant abiding is the one who abides in equanimity. So the third jhana is about this kind of equanimity. Remember, it says, there's a fading away of the rapture. And so this equanimity, I want to mention something about equanimity before we go any further. This idea of equanimity, of course, is a tricky one. One of the things that I like to kind of make clear about equanimity, within the world of Buddhism, they talk about positive or pleasant feelings. They talk about negative or painful feelings. And they also talk about neither pleasant nor painful feelings. You could just call it neutral in a way, neither pleasant nor painful. So pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful, i.e. neutral. Equanimity is not neutrality. Equanimity is not that middle spot that is neither painful nor pleasant. Equanimity is aware of what pleasure is. Equanimity is aware of what pain is. But equanimity is not striving for this and desperately moving away from pain. Equanimity is about understanding their difference, that pain is not pleasure and pleasure is not pain. They are different things. But the equanimous mind moves neither towards nor away from either of them in that way. And you know, I've I've mentioned this before in the past, but you know, pain is a really tricky emotion that way, because there's a certain way of looking at pain as the great teacher. Meaning that if we didn't have pain receptors, we probably wouldn't make it very long. We would do ridiculously stupid things with our body, and probably not make it very far. So there's a way in which pain is there to to teach us and be like, nah, -uh, buddy, you don't want to touch that. Nuh-uh, buddy, you don't want to do that. 
And so if you look at pain that way as a message, as a teacher, it doesn't make pain pleasurable, but it equalizes pain a little bit and makes it not a good thing or a bad thing, but a phenomena. But remember, we're doing this with pleasure as well, where we're recognizing that pleasure is not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It is just pleasure, not pain. So that's the kind of mind state that we're developing or that we have developed moving into the third jhana. And what I want you to notice is that the first two jhanas, we're kind of pretty interested in that rapturous bliss. <laughs> So we're not totally equanimous in that way because we are still sort of leaning towards the pleasurable. Whereas that rapture evens out or it kind of mellows out. And then the third jhana is this equanimous mode. We are still, of course, not with discursive thought. That, that passed away in the second jhana. So the third jhana... Oh, by the way, regarding this discursive thought, I would like to kind of remind you or point to the difference between an experience in which there is the discursive thought that's like, this is a really great experience versus just having the experience. And you're not actually reflecting upon the fact that you're having the experience. It's sort of just being had in a way. And at that point, it would kind of only be after the meditation that there would be the discursive thought thinking, oh, that was equanimous. That was an, equ a, a, an equanimous mind state I was in. But when you're in the third jhana, there's just the experience of equanimity, but without that little, I'm, I'm equanimous right now type of thought. Okay. Fourth jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and of course, with that previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So this is where we have sort of gone entirely beyond all these categories of pe pleasure and pain in that sense. The fourth jhana and the third jhana are kind of very similar in terms of them resting on e equanimity. That is sort of their main thing. But I think that we are st to, to understand and it's by that line in the third jhana where he says, still feeling pleasure in the third jhana, but in the fourth jhana, neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So that's where we're to understand that there's been this kind of total transcendence of Vedana, basically, sensations altogether. And that would kind of add up to the, it would add up in terms of what are we going for here? Like, what's the point of all of this, these jhanas? Well, as we're going to see, these are preparatory for this kind of higher knowledge or this true knowledge as it's going to be called. So there's that. But I would also want to mention, you know, and this is just kind of me Michael interjecting how it is that I understand Buddhism, but we want to understand the role of samskara, meaning the role of conditioning. And what I mean by that is, is the, we want to understand the reinforcing that we do. And what I mean by that is, is that when I think this is ugly, and that's beautiful. When I come to those two things again, and I go, yeah, that's ugly and that's beautiful. I have reinforced that conditioning, th that way of thinking. 
And what that means is, is that the third time I encounter this thing and that thing, it's going to be kind of predetermined how I feel about them. That's ugly. That's beautiful. Oh, I just reinforced it again. So my point is, is that we're kind of in this loop of reinforcing. It's why samsara and all these things are always these wheels. We're just cycling around. And so what we need is a break from discursive thinking. We need a break from applied and sustained thought. In other words, when the mind calms down and eventually sort of stills, there is not the reproducing and replicating of samskaric conditioning. It sort of calms down a little bit. And so you could imagine, and just, you know, just follow me on my hypothetical scenario here. Imagine me being in that conditioned mind state of ugly, beautiful, ugly, beautiful. But then I take a seven day silent meditation retreat, get deep into some jhanas. And after seven days, you show me these two things again. I'm probably not going to rely upon this snap judgment conditioning from before. There will probably be an actual kind of um, uh, fresh eyes, so to speak that can see these two things anew and heck might even be able to see the arbitrary delusional nature of calling things beautiful and ugly. And wouldn't that be something to like see through that? But you're not probably going to be able to see through that arbitrary attribution of beautiful and ugly. If you're locked into the conditioning habit of doing it all the time. So meditation is a break. It's a break from discursive thinking and samskaric conditioning in that way. So that's sort of my spiel about the four jhanas. Any thoughts about that before we get to the three vidyas? Yeah, no. I, 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 I think I got a glimpse of why it's connected to fear and dread, but can you make that more explicit? Why the jhanas are connected? I see why the jhanas are connected to, you know, black, white conditioned thinking. And, you know, I can sort of infer then why, you know, fear and dread are conditioned, but can, can yep. it be more explicit than that? Yeah. Let's dig a little deeper. So we need to, um, um, we need to dig a little deeper into fear and dread. And what I mean by that is not just looking at the opening of the sutta where the Buddha is talking about morality, but let's dig deeper into that. So what we want to be thinking about is why fear? Let's just take a moment. <laughs> now, if we were Buddhist in that way, and we were thinking about why fear, we could probably quickly start to put together some ideas of attachment, clinging to body, all of these different ideas that we've talked about. But if you just sort of start to look at fear, you start to see what's underneath it. And what I'm getting at, Noam, is, is that there's sort of, in a way, like, it's not, I, I okay, how can I put this? Because I don't want to say, I'll, I'll just walk you through my thinking here. I don't want to say that you can't get into a jhana if you're afraid. But I do want to say that you, it sounds like, and I think, that you can't get into a jhana if the underlying causes of fear have not been resolved. And that's what the whole first part of the sutta is about, is about the Buddha overcoming the causes of fear. And then once he had conquered that fear, that opened the portal to being able to gain access to the jhanas and everything beyond it. So it, again, it's not that we have to be stoic and not be afraid in order to get into a jhana. It's about looking at, well, what's underneath the fear? And if I haven't actually resolved that yet, I'm going to still be 
wrapped up in that in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. so it's not saying that by getting into jhanas, you'll overcome your fear. It's it, exactly. It has to become before in that so sense. Around, if once you overcome your fears, you could potentially get into the jhanas. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. helpful. Oh, good. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's all in that line, uh, verse 23, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. What we want to notice is, is that sensual pleasures is actually a cause of fear because it's sort of like, oh, I'm going to lose my goodies or all of that. And so if you're still kind of clinging and attached to that stuff that's causing fear, your mind's in no position to get into a jhana yet. At least that's what sort of the sutta is saying. All right. So with our remaining time, let's talk about these uh, trividya, they're called, the three knowledges. So these are the knowledge of past lives, the knowledge of the rebirthing of other beings, and the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. So the knowledge of past lives is, of course, not unique to Buddhism. It's an, a fundamental part of most forms of Indian meditation. Um, I would kind of, there's a couple of things that we could spend ages talking about. We talk about them often. Um, it, it almost in, invariably comes up, which is this question about the relationship between the teaching of no self and all of these past lives and rebirth, which is that if there's no self, what's all of this rebirth business about? But I've talked about this so much. I'm not really going to go deep into it in that way. My main, main thing that I always say, though, is this teaching of no self is about you, you right now who's hearing this. It's the idea that you might have of you as a kid. And that's the idea of a self, the self that is both here with me now, but was also a child. That's our idea of a self. And that's the self that the Buddha says doesn't exist. There is this that is kind of clinging to memories in that way. And so is clinging to a self-identity. But the thing about that is, is that if you are clinging to that self-identity, then yeah, it was you yesterday, you a week ago, you a month ago, you years ago, and you a lifetime ago. But my point is, is that it wasn't really you last week, two weeks ago, a year ago, or lifetimes ago. But if there is clinging, there is you yesterday, you a week ago, and you five lifetimes ago. That's the Buddhist understanding of reincarnation. It's no different than you thinking you were around a year ago. If you think you were around a year ago, then you also have past lives in that way. So that's the, the quick answer to that idea. Once again, the... Um, Normally, in in the Buddhist kind of way, it's not quite so intentional. Like the Buddha says, I directed, I directed it to knowledge, meaning the mind that was now purified, bright, rid of imperfections, and so on. He says, I directed that purified mind to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. But in the way that this is usually described, Becoming aware of past lives is a kind of symptom of cultivation. And the idea is, is that, and I've been reading more about this. There's a really great book. If I can, I've not met, I don't mention this book enough. This is a really, I love this book. It's a collection of essays. It's called In the Mirror of Memory. I mean, the title alone is amazing. Um, but it's a collection of essays that's about, well, about Buddhism and memory and 
how does memory work with no self and all of that? So an amazing collection of essays. But what it talks about in here is sort of the way that, or there's an essay in there, I should say, that talks about this. And it's how, well, let me try to just put it to you super simply. Regarding the clinging attachment to body as self. So the idea is, is that, yes, I can cling to this body as my myself, as Michael, right? But then, of course, what I get into or what I could get into, I could get into like, I... Michael have long hair and a beard. But then let's say, you know, you know, whatever happened and somebody came and like lopped my hair off and I didn't have my little token man bun anymore. If I were really attached to my image as the guy with the beard and the bun, then losing the bun, I would be like, oh, I don't look like myself, right? I would have that kind of comparison. So what I'm talking about, of course, is like, there are degrees of attachment to self. And it can get so myopic, the attachment to self, to where the idea of myself is like a very specific version of myself. All I'm trying to present is a kind of a hyper fixation on one's self and one's image. Well, the idea is, is that that hyper clinging, hyper fixation on this particular version of self, it actually is what is cutting you off from knowledge of your previous lives. You're so obsessed with this version, you can't remember the other versions. But if you do enough meditation where you are transcending this physical body in that way, and you're spending more time in a state of mind that is not identifying as this and is not even thinking it is this, what they talk about is that that begins to kind of open up. First of all, by the way, it opens up memory of your of this life. You start to remember more of your childhood, even more of your adolescence and infancy. And then you break through and can begin to remember even other lives and bodies. But my point again is that from a Buddhist point of view, all of this is symptomatic. Meaning if, if you have a flash of a past life experience, don't get too excited, but you should note that it happened because it's sort of an indication that there's a loosening going on in that way. So that's sort of a couple of things to mention about the first of these, knowledge of past lives. And then we get this really interesting, um, I don't even know what you would call it, but this sort of like during the first watch of the night, I develop knowledge of past lives and attain this first true knowledge. And then the second watch of the night and then the third watch of the night. So it's a very interesting kind of progression through the watches of the night. Any questions on the first true knowledge before I quickly mention the second and third? So the second is about other people's rebirthing. And you basically, what they talk about is not only you develop knowledge about your own past lives, but you also develop knowledge of other people's past lives and their future lives. There's a great line. Um, it's a, it's a, I love this line. It's, it's a line from the suttas that describes a Buddha, a fully awakened being. And one of the qualities of a fully awakened being, they know where all paths lead. 
and and I I think of that in terms of like, you know, I I I kind of think of it as like when you're um I don't have children myself, but I have a lot of friends who have children, and I know, or I have been with them as they have worried about their child and their child's group of friends because parents know where paths lead, right? And they know, oh, that's where that path leads. That leads to smoking in the locker room and that leads to doing that and that. But that path, that path leads to the varsity, you know, whatever team and that path leads there. So the Buddha sort of, or Buddhas, have this sort of knowledge of where all paths lead in a kind of karmic destiny way. And that's what the second true knowledge is. Um, and that's what he talks about in terms of knowing all these different people and all of their uh, being reborn in various states. And then during the third watch of the night, what basically amounts to the becoming of an arahat so the Buddha's uh, nirvana, as it would be called, the Buddha's awakening, is this knowledge of the destruction of the taints. One important thing to note is the language here. It's not the destruction of the taints exactly. It's the knowledge that the taints have been destroyed. And that's, in Buddhism, that's like an important thing, is the knowledge that they have been destroyed, the knowing that they're gone, they're not coming back in that way. And that brings us to our connection with last week, which are the three asava, the three outflows or the taints, right? And that's that sensual desire, being, and ignorance. So the Buddha is saying that when he achieved this state, he no longer had that sensual desire, no longer had bhava, perhaps a craving for life or a craving for bhava, and no longer had a vidya or ignorance. And of course, this kind of the formula of the Four Noble Truths applied to the taints, knowledge that these are the taints, knowledge that this is the cessation, or knowledge that this is the, what's causing the taints, knowledge of the cessation, and knowledge of the path that leads to their cessation. And of course, then the, the Buddha gets a new follower. They are, the, the Brahmin is so moved by this, uh, by this that he basically becomes a Buddhist in that sense. So... All right, any last questions or ideas about the Fear and Dread Sutta? Awesome. A lovely evening. <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah, I don't know what will be the next sutta. I'll have to look over the next one and see, but stay tuned next week. Thanks, Michael. My great pleasure, Tanya. Thank you Thank so you, much. Michael. Oh, my pleasure. Thank oh, you, by, by the way, Thank oh, you, yeah. thanks everybody. Real quick before everybody goes, I do want to make a quick announcement. Um, so in about two weeks, two weeks from yesterday, on Saturday, February 10th, I'm going to do a three-hour presentation on Buddhism and time, a bunch of different ideas about time as it relates to Buddhism. And so that's just a little presentation on Zoom I'm giving Saturday morning, 9 to 10 on Fab February 10th. And if you're interested in that, you can go to lotusunderground.com. Otherwise, thanks again, everybody, for listening and just for being here. Appreciate it so much.